Welcome to the church family that is lifting lives through living love, inspiring hope, filling with faith, and transforming our world. These recorded messages are made available so that you might have additional opportunities to stay connected with us, and then you might learn and grow in your faith. God bless you as you hear the word today. And now, the message. scripture reading today is from Isaiah chapter 6 verses 1 through 13. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, here I am, send me. He said, go and tell this people, be ever hearing but never understanding, be ever seeing but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people calloused, make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. Then I said, for how long, Lord? And he answered, until the cities lie ruined and without inhabitant, until the houses are left deserted and the fields ruined and ravaged, until the Lord has sent everyone far away and the land is utterly forsaken. And though a tenth remains in the land, it will again be laid waste. But as the terebinth and oak leave stumps when they are cut down, so the holy seed will be the stump in the land. May the Lord bless the reading and hearing of his word. So friends, it is hard to believe that this is the last message that I will give while pastoring here at ZUMC. And it's hard to believe because it seems like uh, my time here has been so long and yet simultaneously so short. Part of that might be uh, the challenges of perceiving time while pastoring in the midst of a, a pandemic. Uh, part of that might also be <laughs> just that we, we brought our second child into the world while here. And uh, sleep deprivation has uh, some funny effects on how you perceive time. But I think a big part of it goes back to the fact that for my family, for Chastity and I, um, we love this community. We love this congregation. And, and we've just been so impacted uh, by the relationships that we've had here. I'm incredibly thankful for uh, your prayers, for your support, for the ways that uh, you've encouraged me, for the ways that I've been able to use my gifts and develop my gifts while here. Um, and it's my prayer that of the things that I've done, that the seeds that I've planted, been able to be a part of, that God would continue to nourish those and, and bring fruit in this congregation because it's my prayer that God would continue to guide you and direct you to bless you. And it's out of that prayer, out of that hope that I've prepared today's message. Uh, I've tried to, to kind of come and meet at the intersection of summarizing some of the things that I've preached on in the past. 
of Pentecost Sunday and then also trying to provide words that I hope will guide you, uh, that will urge you to be who God is calling you to be in this community. It's with that in mind that I, I ask this question, kind of to start out the sermon for real, of what do you think of or what comes to mind when you hear the word called? Like, well, what images, what feelings, what rises to the surface? And I ask that question because it's a word that appears many times in Scripture. And it's a word that gets kind of thrown around in Christian circles, but rarely, if ever, do we define it. It often becomes a bit of Christianese. We say things like, uh, well, I'm trying to discern God's calling for my life. Or the missionaries felt called to preach in Thailand. Or maybe if there's something that, uh, honestly, we don't want to do, we just tell the other person, well, I just don't feel called to that. Right, kind of a Christian cop-out. Again, <laughs> get out of the, the activity that they're asking you to do. But many times when we talk about calling, it's this high and lofty thing. Right? It's something that seems to be reserved for the few. Those special Christians who have this special experience. And sometimes this passage that we've read today from Isaiah chapter 6 is used to support that idea. It's here that we find uh, what, what is often referred to as the call of Isaiah, right? God calling him to take his message to the people of Israel, to, to take God's message and preach it to them, to be his prophet. Now, we have to remember in ancient Israel, there were three spirit-anointed roles that God ordained to mediate his relationship between himself and Israel. There was the king. The king was God's representative to the people, right? Kind of the conduit through which God's blessing would flow to them. There was also the priests. The priests were the people's representative to God. They took the, the sacrifices, those offerings that the people gave, they took them and they offered them there in the temple. They led the people in worship. But then there were the prophets. The prophets acted as God's representatives bringing the messages of God to the people, oftentimes even to the priests and to the kings. And here, when we look at, at Isaiah's story, we find it's a call to be a prophet, a call to take the message of God to the people. It follows that common call pattern that we see in Scripture of there is a call to someone, there is a response by the person who hears it, and then there is an active commission, right? A sending out to go. And when we look at this story, though, I think what we find is this is not just a story for the select few, but it's a story that applies to all of us as followers of Jesus Christ. And I say that because the very first part of that calling, the first call, we might say, is God calling Isaiah to himself. Right? God revealed himself to Isaiah. He gives him this vision. And it doesn't say whether this is like the heavenly throne room or the earthly temple, but he's there and he's before the throne of God and he sees all the angels coming and going ministering to God and making this threefold proclamation, holy, 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 showing that God is perfectly holy. That's why it's said three times to show the completeness. God has revealed himself to Isaiah and he's given Isaiah his words. He has heard them. This is a call. It's a story of God calling. And then you might think to yourself, well, Seth, that seems like kind of a stretch, right? Like, I mean, he hasn't really done anything that special. We have to remember, it, it, it is this revelation that he's received. Something that not everybody gets to see. Not everybody gets to see the throne of God, right? Oftentimes, we see that same pattern, though, in Scripture that we see here. But many times, God actually says the names of people. He calls to them specifically. We see that in the case of Abraham in uh, Genesis chapter 22 with Jacob, then later with Moses, and with Samuel. In each case, God calls their name, Samuel, Samuel. And we see this response that they have, each one the same, here I am. Right, that same response that we see here with Isaiah. 
And friends, it's a reminder that calling first and foremost is God calling us to himself. It's God speaking out to us, beckoning us to come to him, to be known by him and to know him, right? To be his own. This is why the New Testament authors, when they talk about calling, it's often using it in such a way that it's saying you are called to Jesus. You are called by his name. You're called to follow after him. And when Jesus called his own disciples, what were the words that he said to them? He said, come, follow me. Right? His first words were not go. Yes, that would come. But his first words were, come, follow me. It's, it's calling them, drawing them to himself. Again, to be known and to know him, to walk alongside him, to have that intimacy with him. And friends, I remember when I was uh, 13 years old, sensing God calling me to Jesus. I'd grown up in a family that uh, loved each other and loved Christ. And yet it was that moment at this youth event that that the faith of my fathers became my own, or that I heard God's calling and I had to choose how would I respond? Because every one of us has to choose, right? Do we try to hide from the call of God? As we see with Adam and Eve after the fall in Genesis, they hid from God's calling for them. Do we run away like the prophet Jonah when God called him to go to Nineveh? Or do we respond like these others that we've mentioned? With Lord, here I am. Right? It's a reminder that, again, first and foremost, our calling is to Christ. God calls us to himself. It's out of this call that the second call comes. And turning back to our passage, we see that when Isaiah heard God, you know, brought him here and he saw everything that was going on, he was struck with the holiness of God and the contrast with God's holiness and himself. And he proclaimed, woe is me for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Isaiah felt compelled to make this confession, to, to say this. Why? Why? Well, it's because <laughs> holiness is the call for us. Holiness is that contrast between him and God. He was very aware of his own sin, his own brokenness, something that separates us. Sin always breaks relationship. It keeps us apart. And some people say that, that God's goodness and sin are like oil and water, but really it's, it's like more like light and darkness, right? There are two things that cannot exist in the same space. Isaiah recognized this, and it was in confessing it, in saying it, that he could then receive the grace of God to come and cleanse him. Friends, this is a reminder again. We, we look at this, the passages in Scripture. We're told that God is holy, and we're called to be holy. In the Old Testament, the repeated refrain that goes so many times with, with all of the different commands that are given in the law is this other command that just repeats of be holy as I am holy. Peter in the New Testament said that, I mean, he repeated this and then he said, without holiness, no one sees the Lord. That we're called to be holy. We're called to be different, set apart. It's why in the New Testament, so many times when it uses the language of calling, it, it talks about this set apart way that we're meant to live of being called to peace, of being called to hope, of being called to love. It's being called to be the same way that God is out in our world. And it's here in, in this second calling, right, we, we see a connection with Pentecost. Because when Isaiah responded, when he made this confession, an angel of the Lord came from the throne, brought a burning coal and touched it to his lips and said, see, this has touched your lips. Your guilt has been taken away and your sin atoned for. 
Right? In the Old Testament, fire was actually used to cleanse or purify something. It was used to purify Isaiah, to take away his sin. And it's in the New Testament this connection with Pentecost comes because we find that day when all the disciples were gathered, Jesus had ascended into heaven and they were waiting on the Holy Spirit whom God had promised. They were gathered in an upper room and it says that a roaring wind came and that tongues of fire settled on them. Right? Again, fire being a symbol of holiness, of cleansing. When we receive the Spirit, God does a cleansing work in us. It's not something that we can work for, that we can try harder for. It's something that has to be received. It's something that God does. And we're told that in Ephesians that every single one of us, we receive the Holy Spirit when we first believe. It's to make us holy, to make us pure to make us set apart. But it's here in, in this part that we find it leads into our third calling. And that is to go. It is out of the holiness of the work that God does in us that then God sends us out into the world. It purifies us, not just for our sake, but for this purpose, to go. With Isaiah, his lips were cleansed by that burning coal, not just so that he would be forgiven of his sin, but also, so that then his mouth was prepared to take the messages of God to the people, right? Preparing him to be sent, to go. This is that work of God. God calls us to go. And it was for Isaiah, as, as he was there, he was hearing everything that was going on as he had received the work of God for himself, that then the compassion and love that he had led him to say to the Lord's question, you know, who will go for us? Whom shall I send? To say, here I am, Lord, send me. These were the words that, that just resonated so deeply with me the first time I ever heard this passage. It was a couple years after I had come to Christ. I was in my home church and the pastor preached a message on this passage, Isaiah 6. And, and to be honest, it wasn't a particularly good sermon, but it did retell the story. And those words that were in it, they just stuck with me. It's like I couldn't shake them. Who will go for us? Whom shall I send? It, it burned within me and I found in my heart a love and compassion that had not been there before. Now, some people say, Seth, this is your call story of how you were called to be a pastor. And I do think that, that my calling to be a pastor comes out of this, but I think that what God was doing was something much more basic, much more fundamental, and even much more universal, something that applies to all of us. What God was doing in my heart was reconnecting the love of God and the love of neighbor. You see, because up until this point, I really didn't care if anybody else knew or followed Jesus. I mean, I would have said, yeah, sure, it's a better thing they do than not. But I, you know, I knew that God had called me to, to relationship with him, and I knew that I needed forgiveness of my sins, but, but I had made my faith something that was beyond personal. It was private. It was individual. It stopped with me. And so to be blunt, I just didn't care. I didn't care if other people knew or followed Jesus. I figured that's their thing, not mine. And friends, it's my fear that this is uh, the same problem that we have in the church. And I say that broadly in the Church of America, but also here in this congregation. See, we're... We don't try to keep out outsiders. We're not afraid of them. We don't exclude them. I believe if any person comes here, they're going to receive a warm welcome, an earnest hello. They're, they're going to, to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ proclaimed. And yet I, I think that too many times what we're doing, it stops here on Sunday morning. That is where our attention is. It's here amongst us. The very first Sunday that I, I preached here, 
I mentioned a statistic that within 20 minutes of this building, there are over 160,000 people who do not have a community of faith, which they're a part of. Now we're three years later, four years later, and the population has only grown. Church involvement has actually decreased. The problem remains. And again, we're open to people coming and being part of our programs, but I question where is the compassion that drives us to go to them? Because the reality is that for the majority, the overwhelming majority of that 160,000, they're not going to show up here on a Sunday morning. The only way is if we are willing to go to them, to take the message of Jesus to them and share it with them, to love them, to to extend the same grace that we've received to them. See, the problem is, I think too many times we've separated calling and sending. And yet in Scripture, those two things, they're intimately connected. You can't just have the forgiveness of Jesus and the relationship without God also sending you out. Time and time again, we see in Scripture, as God calls people in, he sends them out. We gather here on Sunday mornings because we are called to follow Jesus together. But when we leave from here, God sends us out into the world purposefully. It's this movement that goes back and forth. And it's not a calling that's just for the select few. It's for all of us. You see, in the Old Testament, it might have been that the Holy Spirit only rested on certain people. They had these certain positions, right? But... In a post-Pentecost world, it's a world where every Christian, right, is to receive the Holy Spirit. As Paul said in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, we receive the Spirit when we first believe. The Spirit then works within us to to send us out, to send us out into the world. We, We use different gifts and talents that the Spirit enables. We have different roles, as he says later in the letter, but we're all called. There's not the not called and the called. We're all called. It's been entrusted to the church. It's this grand calling for us all, again, to to take what we have received ourselves and then send it out to the world, that they might experience the same. Now, the... uh, Pastor Oswald Chambers in his devotional, My Utmost for His Highest, talked about this passage here in Isaiah 6. And he said, God did not direct his call to Isaiah. Isaiah overheard God saying, who will go for us? The call of God is not just for the select few, but for everyone. Whether I hear God's call or not depends on the condition of my ears. And exactly what I hear depends upon my spiritual attitude. Now, when I look back at at my life, and I look back at the, the time between kind of these callings that I sensed, I'm ashamed to say how little I cared whether other people knew Jesus. And and I'm a so sad at the the opportunities that I passed up that I missed. I was particularly struck with this when I started seminary. Um, I had a friend reach out uh, who had been a classmate of mine in that time, and he had not been a Christian, and he said to me, I didn't know that you were a Christian. I would say that deciding to follow Jesus was the most important decision I have made in my entire life. And I'd say that the relationship with God is, is the most important relationship in my life, and yet he didn't know. And friends, I, I was part of a, a school that had a graduating class size of 39. So I saw this guy every single day. And we talked all the time. We talked about everything. We talked about our coursework. We talked about sports. We talked about music, relationships, everything. And yet somehow, I didn't tell him about the one thing that had changed my life the most. The one thing that I would say was most important to me. I hadn't told him about that thing that could also change his. Why? Like, how could he not know 
was because I hadn't cared. I had disconnected the call and the send. I failed to live in who God was calling me to be, who God is calling us to be as the church. I'd received the grace of God, but I'd kept it for myself. And friends, what this situation reminds me of is the Titanic. Now, some of you might be thinking, the Titanic? The Titanic. I know, uh, contrary to what some of your grandchildren might think, nobody here is old enough to have been on the Titanic. Um, But we've probably all heard the story. We've all maybe seen documentaries or seen the movie. You might know that it took three hours for the Titanic to sink after it struck the iceberg. And in that time, there were 20 lifeboats that were sent off from that ship, carrying 700 people. And by the time it sunk, another 328 people ended up swimming in that frigid 28-degree water. Now, the lifeboat commanders had been instructed that when they got out, that they should move away from the ship, of course, because the, the suction that a sinking ship creates could actually suck them under, could pull them under. But they were also instructed not to return back in the debris field for survivors. Because they said, you're going to be overwhelmed, there'll be too many, they'll capsize your boat, and you too will perish. And so maybe you've seen the movie, right? The the ship sinks and it was left with a debris field scattered with people. People who were calling out, calling for help. Come, help, save us, I'm over here. And yet nobody went back. The lifeboat commanders stayed outside, just as they'd been instructed. But finally, the conscience of one of those lifeboat commanders got to him. Even though the water had grown still, people were slipping into hypothermia, he commanded his boat back in. But by that time, only six people were pulled from the water who survived. And the thing about that story is those lifeboats, those 20 lifeboats, had a carrying capacity of 1,228, yet carried only 700 people. What that means is that 322 people died that night, not because the Titanic sank, but because those who were saved did not go back to rescue them. Friends, it is a humbling thing to consider that if you have heard God's call for you, calling you to Christ, if you have received the grace, the forgiveness that he offers, that you are already in safety and that you have the opportunity, the opportunity, privilege even, to to go back to those who are still in peril, who still need the same work, the the same forgiveness, the same healing and redemption and restoration that God is working and has worked in your life for them to receive that as well. That just as, as he's called you to himself, he's also calling you to go to them. Because friends, we live in a world where people are drowning in sin and brokenness. And all we have to do is turn on our TVs, right? Turn on the news and we're reminded of this. It's overwhelming. We live in a time where there's an epidemic of of loneliness, an epidemic of depression. A time when people apparently think that the way to solve their problems, to let out their anger, is to take a firearm into a crowded room and start taking other people's lives. They think that's gonna be the solution to their problem. And even here in picturesque Zionsville, people are suffering. They're struggling. Right behind perfect houses and perfect lawns, people inside are anything but. They're dealing with hidden addictions and dysfunctions. There are marriages that are falling apart. There are people who are weighed down constantly with guilt and shame. Guilt over what they've done, shame over who they are. And they're crying out for help. Like those in the frigid waters of the North Atlantic, they are shouting for someone to lend them a hand. 
And I believe once again, God is calling to us and asking, who will go for us? Whom shall I send? And I believe the call that all of us have to respond to, both as individuals and as a church, will we go? Will we say along with Isaiah, here I am, Lord, send me? Will we go to them? Again, we're, we're, if we're going to go, it's not, not that we're going to go and we're going to be the saviors. None of us can save anyone, can't even save ourselves but we know the one who can. It's all about connecting people with Jesus Christ, simply extending the same love, grace, joy, mercy, forgiveness, extending that to others, reaching out a lending hand for them, giving them the opportunity to respond to God's love for them. This is who we're called to be as the church. And it's a challenge that's not just for us, but it's for every single church. Because we live in a nation that is in so need of people of God to rise up and to be who he's called us to be. So will we go? As I close, I simply want to ask, have you heard the call of God to you, calling your name? Have you responded, here I am? Have you received the forgiveness and cleansing offered to all who receive the Spirit, right? All who, who believe in Christ's name. And have you heard God's call to go to the least, the last, and the lost? Have you responded, Lord, send me? Friends, let's pray. God, today we thank you for your grace. We thank you that you call us to yourself, that like a loving father, you come to embrace us, that you desire to know us and draw us close. We thank you as well that you make this possible by your grace, that you forgive us the sins that we have. You cleanse us, you give us a new heart. You break the chains of sin that hold us and, and keep us down so that we might walk in freedom. But Lord, I ask in this time that as you have given your Holy Spirit to all who believe, that your Spirit would guide us back out into the world to take your grace and love to others. Lord, help us hear your call to us and go to receive your commission and be the people that you've called us to be right here in our community, in our families, with our coworkers, with our friends, wherever we are, Lord, help us to be the people you've called us to be and help this church to be the church that you've called it to be. Not only for those gathered here, but for the sake of the world that you love, the world whom you gave your son, Jesus Christ, for. It's in his name we pray and commit all of this to you this morning. Amen. Good morning. My name is John Ellagood and I'm the Director of Communications here at Zionsville UMC. Thank you for joining us today. We'd love to get to know you more and spend some time with you. If you'd like to know more about our faith community, please visit our church website at zumc.org. There, you'll find the many ministry opportunities that we have to offer. If you need to contact one of our staff members, all our contact information is at the bottom of all of the church web pages. You can also connect with us via social media throughout the week for daily inspiration and community. You'll find us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube under username Zionsville UMC. Once again, thank you so much for joining us this morning, and we hope that you have a great week.